This session is being recorded. Thank you, John, for joining us. Um, we're really excited no to have you here on the Lunch and Learn session and hear more about MicroKeeper. So can you give us a brief overview of what MicroKeeper does? For sure, yeah, and, and thank you so much for having us uh, on today. You know, we really appreciate it, and we're always excited to be a part of these um, types of seminars. Um, but yeah, MicroKeeper is sort of a, an all encapsulating from basically when you, you employ the staff member to the day they're sort of ter terminated management tool. So we sort of like to break that down into the core HR, rostering, time and attendance, payroll, STP, super clearing um, framework um, that builds builds out our system. Excellent, excellent. Now, do you have a slide deck here? Do you, are do. you going to? Are you happy to go through that, or do you want me to run through questions? That, yeah, no. So, go through that. Well, so basically, my role at Microkeeper is I liaise with a lot of our um, our customers and find out where their um, pain points are, how they need to improve, and what they're trying to achieve out of a system or multiple systems, and then help guide them through what they want to select and what they what they actually may not even think they know to begin with. So um, yeah, I really enjoy that role. It's um, it's always changing, and we always meet new people and um, yeah, explore their business. So what we try to do as a system is unpack everything and sort of then bring it back into one spot so you do have an overview of all of the elements that you sort of require for sort of business management in one section so we're not worrying about multi-systems and you know staff having to log into multiple things to try and achieve um, a desired outcome is sort of our sort of main focus as i mentioned the, the rostering the core hr timesheets and payroll are our four pillars um, Obviously, we do have um, a lot of customer uh, input. That's what builds our system, what makes it better, um, what, what finds holes in essence, because everyone who uses our system are the best critiques on what they need and, and what they want to see. So that's sort of what drives um, our development forward. Um, once we've got uh, obviously someone on board and into the system, it's not so much that uh, we always just want to hear from the admin department because we do want to hear from everyone, the employee view, the manager view, and, and obviously the payroll bookkeeper account view as well, because um, obviously everyone needs something slightly different. Um, we do have sort of a breakdown of our, our package up here in sort of the four key pillars. We do have a, a sort of a free trial starter for a one employee business. We do have one that just accommodates for purely STP um, and, um, and basically making you compliant. And then our most common is our standard and premium, which gives you sort of everything that we'll have a discussion about today. Um, and, and obviously our, our phone support and email support, which we um, really pride ourselves on down from our Geelong head office. Well, I think you're going to shock people because you were upfront with the pricing and uh, the apps are never upfront with the pricing. So thank you for that. And I'll for people um, who are listening in later on, this is April 2021 where you're seeing those pricings. Thank you, John. No stress. Um, so, so yeah, so basically from that point of view, um, that's sort of what MicroKeeper is about as a bit of a, uh, a sort of an overview. And we could sort of launch into... Um, sort of what the system looks like, I suppose, and, um, you know, what you could expect out of out of the system as well. So what I'll do is I'll just move this across and we shall, we'll have a look at, uh, at this area of the platform together. So this one here is, um, is the first page that anyone will log into, um, obviously as a MicroKeeper user. Um, and obviously the first thing we see is our control panel. Now, the idea is, dynamic page, we can look at this um, as any type of person, but basically as a business, we can assign what people need to see. So what departments, what areas of business they need to manage. And obviously our page dynamically changes based on the access level we're giving to a staff member. So the idea is it's live, it's 24 hours, and it's gonna give you what you want. So, you know, who's rostered, it does an absentee check as we can see there. So it's checking time and attendance versus what's rostered and so forth and finding if people are missing shifts. Activity feed, you know, it's an audit trail. That's that's basically the, the high and the low of it. It tells you what's going on and who's doing what. And then finally, the clocking status of staff members over here on the on the right hand side. We can use that for also emergency evacuation procedures and so forth. Obviously, our system also incorporates leave. So again, another element of the platform 
in this area is the lead management. Um, again, we dynamically assign who uh, needs to review leave based on the business. Um, in this area, we're showing you an overview of, you know, this is the leave you need to review. And then when we delve into an individualized leave like this particular one here, it'll tell us all the information that we need. So, you know, balances, how much is being requested, if they're supporting documentation like um, doctor's certs and other bits and pieces. But most importantly, I find and feel is that middle section is the overlap. So, you know, is somebody else on leave already that I need to consider as a manager that's going to clash or, you know, am I only able to have three people off at one particular time to run the business? So this gives you all of that information um, to sort of move forward with. Obviously, we also have decision-making buttons on, you know, um, tap, talking to the staff member, accepting, declining, et cetera. So basically, um, the next sort of thing that I sort of like to describe the system in is a way in which a, a staff member will see the system. So from the very start, obviously, we can upload, you know, all your staff members via a, a CSV, but then ongoing, we're going to enter them in. So once you've entered a staff member, all we need is a first name, surname and a contact method. Uh, once that's done, we send them their user credentials and they log into the suite. Now, once you've logged into the suite, the first thing you'll come to is your employee console. Now, this is obviously um, accessible via a web browser like we're seeing today or, or directly through the MicroKeeper app. Um, you know, we definitely see a massive skew toward the app. A lot, of the, a lot of staff members use it on their smartphones or iPads or whatever it is. So the first step is what we call the core HR. So files and skill sets so this is where staff members can be given their employment contract you might have to sign a code of conduct upload a driver's license you know you might have a COVID check or whatever it is that all starts there um, we then move down to the completing your profile which is usually about you know five or ten percent complete based on a few of the metrics we inputted and then obviously they can do the remaining so you know online tax file declarations and uh, emergency contacts bank details address date of birth gender all of those things that we would need they do that all themselves and onboard them um, obviously moving down the page we then have a display of you know what as a staff member do you need to see so it all starts obviously with rostering so they can see their roster they can sync it to their calendar suites you can have accept decline buttons breaks etc etc um, we also have clocking methods so we have seven clocking methods this is one of the seven this is um, a browser clock um, pay slips as many as they've received within the system message to payroll, obviously, timesheets, we can see them building, they can't change it, but they can note to it. Um, and then, you know, leave requests, you know, any leave that they would like, and they can have, they can request leave on, it can show them balances and predicted balances, etc. Uh, we have a messaging portal, we have a calendar view, skills and files and, and MFA or multi-factor authentication. Um, leave review, this area here shows them what status their leave is currently at, uh, at any time. And then finally, personal details that they can update is stored down here, along with um, availability that can flow through to rostering, uh, et cetera. Now, one of the things that I sort of just touched on just then was um, some of the clocking methods. So clocking methods in MicroKeeper definitely, um, uh, you know, depend on what you're trying to achieve. But, you know, in essence, we sort of try and find the best suit to you as a business. So we've got facial recognition that is one of our uh, hardware options. It's been quite popular during COVID being that it is totally touchless if you so wish. Um, but it also has its, its place in, in many other businesses where you may be a dirty environment, you can't use like a fingerprint or something like that and you want a biometric. So that's one of our options. Um, mobile app, very, very popular. Um, two sort of fashions of this, which is GPS tracked. So we just track you when you clock on and off. So people like sales reps and those, those sorts of things, we can we can utilize the app for, or businesses where you want to location restrict. So, hey, we've got four different sites. When you're inside of the site, you can clock on. We've got that as an option as well. Fingerprint scan, we sort of touched on earlier, but um, the fingerprint scan is a great option as well. Biometric, very fast. Um, but obviously, you know, it has its, its limitations. You know, if you are in a very dirty environment, it's probably not the go-to. Um, Near field communication is also another one. We spoke about browser, which was just before, which can be IP restricted. Um, near field communication. This one's good, not only for dirty environments, but environments where you also have NFC existing for opening doors and so forth. You can utilize that. We also offer in the clocking station and the like. So basically 
once chosen one or multiple of these, it doesn't really matter how many you want. It's, it's totally up to you as a business. We have some businesses having just one, some businesses having five, um, depending on what you, what you really need. But basically the staff member then can clock their hours into the system. Um, and then the hours uh, obviously are automatically turned into uh, time and attendance. But obviously prior to time and attendance even occurring, um, one of the things that a lot, a lot of businesses do with a casualized workforce is um, they look at rostering. So rostering in the system, because we are a total payroll engine, again, can be broken down into department or, um, or uh, location of the business. We are overlaying uh, on all of the roster data, we are overlaying costs. So basically you can start to build a roster out just like these ones here around, you know, the location, we've got even the role of the staff member and then how much is that gonna cost us? And you know, where do the breaks need to come out? Where are the penalty rates, et cetera? As you're building a roster, obviously you wanna select staff. So it tells you who's available and it's checking those things like, you know, do they have the right skill sets? Are they available as in, does it clash with availability? Are they currently rostered on, are they on leave or, or the like? So you don't have to have multiple rosters like people have leave rosters, availability rosters, et cetera. And you cross-reference all of them to build this. The system is trying to do it in the background for you to give you, you know, the instant information you need to make a decision. But basically, once we've created a roster, we've popped in a start time and an end time, uh, we may have assigned it to a job and given the staff member some notes on that. We then can distribute this out. So we can send it out directly via a push notification, SMS or syncing it to their, their calendar suite. So iCal, Google Cal or Outlook calendar. Um, so obviously the staff then have that roster. They clock in via one of our methods that we've mentioned just earlier on. And then it's over to our management team to, um, to do some reviews. Now, this is one that we'd sort of prepared a wee bit earlier, but basically what we then do is overlay time and attendance and roster data together. So you've got a comparison. So the way we like to look at it is colors. So the first one there, you've got um, a few, uh, an all gray shift, which is the middle one. And then a couple of shifts that have got a few different colors on them. The gray shift means the staff member has done exactly what we want. So their, their roster and their time and attendance exactly reflect. So that's a good thing. That's what we're after. So we indicate that by a whole gray shift. Now, if we've got some colors, green means we've um, saved a bit of money in comparison to our roster. Or we're, we're under budget and red means we're over budget based on our roster. So very quickly, just by colors, you can see what's going on. So for businesses who have got lots of staff and managers responsible for a lot of staff, this is a game changer because they can just scan through the colors and know exactly what's going on. Um, obviously we can make changes just by clicking on the times. As soon as we make a change, it'll obviously tell us via a color indication and tell us what the original entry was. Now, prior to the shifts being reviewed, they sit in a gray state, just like this one here. Um, and to review it, it's just one click to accept, two clicks to decline, three clicks to reset. So very, very simple. And again, auditing all of that. So making sure we know who's done it and when. So the other things that we can see on here, we see some spanners, which are we can job track. So if you've got staff members who do multiple tasks, different pay rates assigned to that, even different awards around those things, we can automate that process, as well as the pencil, which is a note um, that a staff member or manager has added. Now, because again, we're doing this overlay, we can again, turn some automations on. So we can turn automations on like auto approve. So if the shift is perfectly great, hey, let's auto approve it or we can turn things on like roll forward windows. So what happens if their start time in their roster is nine and they clock on at 8.45? Do we just wanna roll the start time forward? And do we wanna give them a window of opportunity to do that? So these are all parameters we can set in the background. But basically once the um, time and attendance has been reviewed, we then run our payroll, which is easy as clicking the payroll tab, um, new pay run, it'll default to the next pay run within our sequence. And we simply hit that blue pay run button at the bottom which generates a pay run just like this. It's as easy as then clicking the pay slip button, which brings us to our pay slip page. Now, yes, we could go through all these pay slips individually and scan through them and check them one by one. That's probably okay if you've got a handful or even you know 20 or 30, but what I like to see is what we call a heat map, which does analysis for you. So this is checking the pay slips. And what it does is it looks at things like last cost to business, last week cost of business versus this week, ordinary time earnings versus ordinary time earnings, you know, last week versus this week again. We also check through things like is there, you know, the same hours in their timesheet versus their pay slip, or we also cross-reference 
what their goal hours were in their profile. Um, is it their first pay run, et cetera, et cetera. So we're trying to do as much of that analysis as we can and just present you with the data where you need to make a decision. So we do that over here. And obviously you can um, jump over these red indicators and it'll tell you which ones we need to make a change. So instead of looking at the 50 pay slips, let's just click here and look at 11 of those 50 um, to find you know, the ones that are the real, um, the real issues. Obviously we can come through a pay slip and we can make modification just like I'm doing now. And obviously when we change something, it'll recalculate everything on the fly. Anything that's on a pay slip that's a button or that is in red only is an administrative tool and staff don't see it. But we can do anything on a pay slip, edit, obviously add, leave. We can do one touch termination. So click the final button, pay out all of the leave, um, terminate them, set them as a final for STP all in one button click. Um, if there is a point where you do need to do things like um, termination ETPs or lump sums, again, all can be done from the convenience right on the pay slip here. So, okay, we've checked our pays. We're pretty happy with this. We're ready to progress on. What do we do now? Well, we, we follow the four buttons across the top, which is create a backup for your own server. We move through to, if anyone wants a hard copy, we can, we can obviously facilitate that as well as then creating the ABA pay file um, for the staff, sorry, for the, the bank where we can upload or our CANS team can upload and pay everyone all at once. Um, finally, we have the lock week, which distributes the pay slips electronically to the staff members profiles and gets us ready to lodge STP. So we lodge STP through MicroKeeper just by clicking whether it's a normal or a final run, review the data and then click submit. So, okay pays are now done and now we want to report on this information so we want to go to our reporting page now depending on what um what package you use in accounting whether it's myob with a triple or it's zero it would be set up in slightly different ways but this one here is illustrating an myob um, this is an upload download scenario where we can in essence um, create all of the appropriate accounts where we want to send all the costs to business, expenses, uh, deductions and tax to in our accounting system. Um, a slight variation on a zero, zero is all API driven. So all this data we can retrieve and then send all the data seemingly, seamlessly across to um, you know, our accounting engine. Um, so once we've now reported on this information to our accounting suite, the other things that we'll do on a semi-regular basis is pay super. So for example, this one be me paying July super, the Zizi is choosing the um, month or period that you want to pay it for, and then simply um, running this report. What it actually does is it actually checks, is there any missing data that's gonna make super refund to us? So then we can, we can obviously rectify that. We don't wanna send data through that's gonna re refund. So we don't let you do it. We just say, hey, I've, you've got two options, we fix it, or we ignore these errors and we process everybody else and process these people at a later date. But basically all we need to do is look at this number here. That's what we owe. Um, and we can validate that number by scrolling through all of the funds uh, here. Once we've had a look, we've got the total for all funds across the bottom. And then obviously validating that 1604.75 with that top number. So to pay it, we just confirm the number in this box, click the I confirm, a button will appear here that says pay super. You click that button, direct debits the amount of money you've um, obviously approved and confirmed from the bank account above that you've specified and simply clears it through the super choice clearinghouse payment gateway. So that's sort of the uh, sort of, I suppose, normal day-to-day -day things that you would do with payroll and obviously around payroll semi-regularly. And obviously we do have all of these other nice reports that we can utilize. So depending on how much of the system we're using or how much breakdown we are wanting to achieve on jobs and costing, you know, these reports obviously expand and are all obviously dictated by this filter over here on the left-hand side. So we can look at things like the, um, the month, the quarter, we can look at specific date ranges. We can also look at um, things like, you know, active, inactive, state, et cetera. Um, and um, obviously even drill down to individualized staff member. And once we've set our parameters, obviously all of these reports rebuild and you can definitely look at them online as a, as a HTML or we can download them as a, a CSV or Excel or PDF uh, copy for printing. So um, as a sort of, 
for very high level overview that sort of would incorporate you know the um the platform and what we're sort of all about and definitely you know it's not we're definitely not a hard and fast in that you have to use absolutely everything we've got businesses who use certain elements and you pick apart the bits that you need um but obviously it's all there for you to 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 use if you if you so wish um and you know obviously that um it gives you the the, I suppose, ability to know you can grow with the system or the system can grow with your business rather, um, you know, and move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've got the technical mute button there. Um, you sh I've, I have a few questions for you, John, but thank you very much oh. for sharing that demo with us. What does it integrate with? I know you've said MYOB and zero. Is there anything else we should be aware of? Yeah, so look, we definitely, um, we don't limit to just, just those things. And we do have a lot of bespoke integrators. So one of the real key benefits of MicroKeeper is that I'll just jump down here, is that we do have an open API. So businesses that do come to us and say, you know, um, you know, we want to run these reporting on, you know, our sales versus our wage cost, and they might use, say, for example, a Dynamics, they can pull the data directly out of the API and, and go from there. So we um, we sort of, we have a lot of partner integrators um, that integrate to us um, is basically the, the sort of the long and short answer. No, that's great. Thank you. What does a typical app stack look like for you? When you have a client, a very typical client, what other solutions are they using around MicroKeeper? Um, it's a good question. Um, usually when it comes to, to specifically our space, um, they are usually just using our, our platform. So it'll be using us for rostering, us for time and attendance, um, us for payroll. And then they'll usually use, yeah, like your zeros or your myobs or your Intuits or it depends on, you know, the industry. Um, but usually people are coming to us with a key focus on streamlining and I suppose, bringing everything into one. So when we do see other things, um, it's not so much something that uh, I suppose is around our space. It just might be that they might use um, like, for example, an Alfie, which is like a, a really bespoke training tool um, that they'll use. And they may use the skills and files area where they'll pull data from Alfie or show data that Alfie's, um, you know, I suppose built, um, but from from a point of view of sort of I suppose if you looked at it as sort of like almost a supply chain of you need these things to do a certain task. Usually people are coming because they want an all in one. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I've got one more question for you, um, and then I'm going to open up to um, um, the um, everyone who's attended today. So I'm going to ask my question, and then I'm coming to you, Michelle Wessel. So just get ready for that. Um, what does MicroKeeper not work well with? What businesses is it not really maybe aligned with mm -hmm. it's, it's a good question it, it it really look we do have you probably i, I suppose it's a, it's a bit of a cliche answer but we do probably have nearly um a business in every single industry um i suppose when you say not work well for i'd probably almost re or like sort of tweak that and say what benefits what sort of businesses wouldn't benefit as much mm -hmm. um, would probably be like more the like a, just a direct salaried business in the past would be you know if it's super super easy and it's just like hey we've just got to punch out some salaries and they're exactly the same every single week yeah you're not going to get as much of a benefit as let's say a business that is um, very much a casualized workforce you know at quite in, intense awards um, they are going to get a, a bigger benefit but where that's now changed is with the uh, salary packaging. So a feature that we've uh, we've worked on quite extensively and is uh, due to be released as of the start of the financial year is the ability to run um, sort of parallel pay runs for salaried staff. So what we're paying you as a salary, but then look at your time and attendance data, run it around what you would be paid if you were paid off the award and give us a variation and then keep that number going week in, week out or pay cycle in and out and see where we're going up and below. So you as a business can obviously find, um, am I paying well above or am I sort of on the borderline and I may need to top them up at the end of the year or, or give them less hours maybe in the last two months just to, to bring it back on par. So that would have probably been in the past my answer, but sort of moving forward, um, yeah, uh, that's going to change. 
Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Michelle, did you want to jump on and ask your question? Here she is. Hey, Michelle. <laughs> Michelle's dialing in from Perth. Hey, you going, Michelle? Thanks, Heather. Hi, John. Um, I've been looking for a payroll package for my one of my NFP clients. Um, yeah. The main problems that we have is different levels of manager approvals. So we've got managers and then we've got CEO, and it has to yeah. go through both levels. Um, yeah. And then there is a lot, unfortunately, of toil that people take and crew and just want to know how easy it is to address that. Yeah. So, look, we definitely do have businesses who have multiple layer of approval. Um, you know, you obviously from the very beginning, we do have just the, the tick approval, and that's usually the manager level because what we're wanting to know is, you know, basically, you know, are those hours the hours that the staff members are doing that you're overseeing? So, you know, that's the, the first level. Obviously, we then move through to, to the payroll office. So the payroll then would run the pay run as per normal based on the hours that are approved. But prior to submitting STP, prior to running, um, you know, uh, the ABA file or anything like that, we then do have in some businesses like CEO type approval, where what they'll do is they'll go to that study report I, I spoke about just earlier on and they'll run the payroll summary and they'll submit that payroll summary basically to the CFO. Um, the CFO can then review it and give it its final uh, level of sign-off. Um, the biggest sort of, I think, question that we usually get once someone sort of looks at the system as a whole is the multi-tiering of approval then sort of, I suppose, slightly comes undone because the questions that then they say is they say, well, the first level of management, they, they approve the hours. Okay, so if they approve the hours and that's the hours that the staff member has done, if it then goes up another level of management or another two levels of management or whatever it might be, and that staff member has done, let's say it's a Monday and they've done nine hours on that particular Monday, and the manager said, yep, they've done that, would the second level manager say, no, they didn't do that or we're not going to pay them for that? And usually the answer comes back and it's like, well, no, no, we don't go, oh, that's over budget. So we're just going to dock you three hours. So we're then under budget again. It's, it's all then around, oh, well, you know, that first level of management is, is doing it. We're just going to maybe question them next time in why you are proving so many overtime hours or whatever that is. So um, then what they then go to is more that reporting um, side. Now, the other question I suppose you spoke about, which was the the toil. Um, so yes, we do deal with you know RDOs, time in lieu, and all that sort of thing. Um, it depends on how the business wants to structure it, whether it's automated, semi-automated, fully manualized, which will obviously then um, dictate, I suppose, how much work's involved. But we have a facility to do either of those. So what we see sort of most commonly is a semi-automated scenario where they're banking it um, or, or it's, it's going to a toil bank. And then basically a staff member can kind of like um, annual leave can actually request to use hours from yep. that bank. And um, that can then go through an approval process again, very, very similar to leave. Um, hopefully that sort of answered your question. In On um, the timesheet schedule, would the 12 that they've taken or accrued, would that show as a different colour or...? No, it, it specifically typically shows up on the payslip area and it's sort of like um, basically it'll show you a total amount of hours that they've worked and then yeah. an, another line on the payslip of how many hours you're banking. So in the automated scenario, fully automated, what it would do is it would go, okay, how many hours do you only want to pay for? So you might go, we only pay a 40 hour week. So let's yeah. say it'll go, okay, this staff member's worked 48. It'll say 48 is a top line. Then it'll say a toil bank of eight. So they'll be taking eight out and putting it into the bank and then the, obviously the balance will be paid and then obviously when we then pay it out the same scenario you'll have let's say they worked a short week and they work let's say 36 hours the system can if you want automatically pull out of the bank and top up to 40 so go 36 adding another four making it 40 and then you've got that sort of consistent pay if you yes. wanted it fully automated okay awesome thanks john no worries Thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us and asking that question. Um, I'm now going to turn to Joy. Joy, you have a question there for, for John. Yes, I was just wondering, with, especially with the hospitality industry, do you do award interpretation? Because there's so many different little um, extras that you've got to pay in hospitality, um, which yeah. is quite, quite painful. And do you also pick up if when someone's birthday is, especially if you're, they're on a junior salary? Yes. So um, 
the answer so, so the specific award interpretation itself like hey we're on you know the retail award will microkeeper interpret it um sort of the hard and fast answer is we don't specifically tell you this is what you need to pay our system can interpret it so you come to us and go this is what we're doing this is how we want to pay can you set it up for us mm -hmm. absolutely big thumbs up can do that um if you want someone like a you know, a legal entity to physically give you a piece of paper that says this is all perfect. This is exactly your, you know, level one staff member, James Smith, level two. We can definitely get you in touch with many of our partners who who do that. Um, and so, you know, that, that's definitely something we can do. But the from the automation point, absolutely. And that second question you touched on, which was from the age um, sort of side, we have what we call rate rules, which what we can do is we can look at things like the age of the employee. So, hey, when they're 18, they get this much. When they're 19, or when they're 17, 18, 19, these are when it changes. Duration of employment, role, job, et cetera, to obviously vary that basic rate all fully automatically for you. You don't have to do that. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of um, how we do it. We won't specifically interpret the award and tell you this is what you need to pay because there are so many little intricacies like what's in their contract what are they doing mm. you know what's dictated but if basically you come to us and go this is what it is this is how we want it to work we can definitely set our system up so it will interpret off what you've you've um you've told us excellent thanks no thank you thank you so much for joining us joy do you have any other questions or is that uh, that was it fantastic <laughs> <laughs> Sean, I have another question here, and this is from Deb, who um, I'm asking on behalf of Deb. Does yep. MicroKeeper pick up change of Superfund USI? Yeah, so we do. So what will happen is back in that report uh, that we looked at before, which was the, um, the super breakdown via uh, fund, which I'll just go back to it here, it will pick it up here. So what it will say is, for example, when one fund closes and it, and it, or it merges into another fund, it will tell you there and there'll be a little merge button and you can just click that and, it, and it'll um, obviously merge one to the other. So if you've got a bunch of staff members on one particular fund and you know, it needs to be moved, it'll pick it up in the checker here and then it'll tell you that they need to be merged across and you just click one button and it's done. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. Hopefully, Deb, that answered your question. Um, let us know if you've got any further questions there. Um, I have another question here from um, Letitia. Letitia, are you happy to jump on and ask your question? If not, I will ask the question. So let me find it here. It's, it's a long one. No, so she's, she's not able to jump on. So I'm going to ask it for her. So, Perfect. John. For remote locations where APPS will not work for building sites, the finger yes. scanner would not be appropriate. Is the other item being used robust enough for job sites? Yeah, definitely. So we um, we do have in a number of um, civil and commercial construction facilities uh, the NFC, um, and, and it is really good. It, it's it's really quite bulletproof um, in that you know people have them on their keychain. It goes in the wash, and you know it still works. Um, so they are very very good. The other one though, which is quite good, is the facial recognition because it doesn't matter about the dirt and how dirty the environment is. The other one that's really nice about the facial is it's the only one of our offerings that can work offline. So basically, if you're um, off, like, let's say, uh, uh, you might be using like a SIM, a data SIM to run the data through to MicroKeeper and, you know, that drops out or whatever, which is pretty standard, let, let's face it. Um, the system will automatically store the data directly through to the um, facial recognition device. And as soon as the um, internet comes back, it then just automatically syncs. So the benefits of that is that employee experience is retained and you don't get the go up to it, it doesn't work and they just try or they hit it harder or whatever the case is. The employee experience is identical. They walk up to it, it clocks them on. They walk away from it. They come back at the end of the day, it clocks them off. Everything is fine from an employee point of view. And usually in that commercial space, you've got larger staff count. So it is an issue when you do have the internet down for a period of time. If you've got 300 
staff trying to clock on. That's the last thing that you want to do is enter that time manually. So being able to store that data locally and then obviously resend when we have internet back is quite good. Um, but yeah, definitely the NFC um, is quite robust. We definitely see it um, in some quite testing uh, environments. Letitia is very excited that um, you can use it offline. So thank you for that, <laughs> that's great. Nicole, did you wanna jump in and ask your question? Um, my question is for our clients, they're not wanting a robust system. Um, at the moment, most of them are salary, so it's they don't have a low casual, so it's not a big issue. Um, but yeah. the thing I'm looking for right now is the onboarding tool. Can we get that on its own or is it a whole box and dice? No, no, de definitely you can. Um, from a pricing point of view, um, obviously the, the, the pricing would just be on the standard plan. So that doesn't differ, but definitely you can just use the onboarding tool and then it'll give you like a really nice um, Excel of, of everything that you've got there, or we can just store the data or, or do sort of, um, you can access it via API. So uh, we do have that employee, um, add employee, retrieve employee API as well. So depending on, yeah, what you're trying to achieve, yeah, you could definitely just use that. At the moment, we're receiving tax file number declarations by email and um, I'm keen <laughs> on it. So I want yeah. to find something that we can eliminate that. That's not going to be too difficult for anyone to use. For sure. It's actually, it's, it's real funny. Um, and it's quite a good point. You just sort of raised there not too difficult for people to use. The other thing that we didn't even think about was almost like a comfortability, if you like, that's sort of a, there we go, made up John word, but how comfortable you are in actually using something. And what we've actually found via asking our, our um, employee users is sometimes when you're given that massive wad of paper and it's like, hey, fill all of this out, you know, and if you make a mistake and you, I don't want to look bad on my employer and all of that sort of thing, and should I fill it out right now or, you know, all, all of that, they actually feel that um, going to a digital platform, I can do it um, in a space that I'm comfortable in, which could be their home, and they have the ability to ask for help. So, hey, I've got to a point here, I'm not sure what my tax file number is, who do I need to ask, or maybe I'll ring my accountant, or whatever it is, and they don't feel that pressure of, I'm, I'm inking this, if I make a mistake, you know, is, is the is you know the world going to fall apart around me? Um, it just... That, that's one of the things that we've had heard back is they just feel really comfortable in doing it that way because they can do something, they can pause, they can go away from it. And then they might come back and talk to a friend and say, Hey, I didn't quite get that. What did you do there? And Oh, this is what that is. Oh, beautiful. Open it. And they do it. So um, that was one thing that, you know, we sort of thought would have been a challenge to get people from going from a full manual to an automated sort of um, digital forum was going to be that step where, um, yeah, we sort of found that it's, it's actually, yeah, quite the opposite. I'm a bit concerned if they're asking a friend to fill that out, they may, may end up with a Dodge Ram at the end of it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. Or, or they're pulling their tax file number off the top of the Woolworths um, receipt docket, <laughs> which has been done several times before. We Thank you very much, Nicole. No more questions. You've gone off mute there. Um, we have some more questions rolling in on the chat area. You are welcome to jump in and, and ask your questions. But in the meantime, I'll, I'll um, ask them. Joy has asked, is, is there a limit on the number of employees you can be processing? Yeah, great question. Um, look, at the, at the moment with MicroKeeper, in one particular account, you know, we sort of, we have businesses in the vicinity of um, sort of six to 8,000 staff members. Um, not to say that we could not go further than that. Um, we definitely could because it's, you know, cloud-based platform. It's just probably at, we wouldn't like, I suppose, our, let me rephrase it. Our development team wouldn't like the delays or the little um, bits and pieces. So, you know, we currently do it for that size business and do it very, very comfortably. Um, but if, you know, you came to us and said, hey, I've got a, a business that had, you know, 15,000 staff, it's not a no. It's just to tell us about the business. What are they wanting to achieve? Or what are they, which elements are they using? Um, and it quite could quite possibly be a yes. What is a six to 8,000 employee business integrating with for the accounting package? Yeah, good question. Funnily enough, um, some are using like a, a Dynamics and they're having it fully bespoke built. Um, others are even just using zero because um, they don't obviously have the limits of employee count. Um, 
you know, this particular one that I'm thinking of, they're in sort of a, a labour hire space, but it's quite a bespoke labour hire. They do um, like pop-up events in, in essence. Um, and basically, yeah, they're sort of, the invoicing isn't, isn't crazy. Like they've got, they've got an event, they invoice that, put that event, and then they might do, you know, 40, 50 events a year. Um, so, you know, zero suffices really well for them. Um, but, you know, then you look at, you know, our commercial services space, which is like you know, cleaning, security, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they definitely need something more robust. And yeah, as I said, you do see some going down the path of bespoke individualized accounting suites developed specifically for their industry or you'll have others that'll use you know like a dynamics and and make it their own um so yeah it sort of it does vary it it's very interesting that like you could be sitting there with 62,000 employees 6200 employees and a 52 dollar zero plan <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> but there there it is um so thank you for that um deb has asked are employees included in the user count Yes. So um, basically anyone who is accessing the MicroKeeper platform. So when we do look at uh, billing, it's, um, if I just jump back to that previous uh, slide and we just go to our pricing page, it's basically per user per month on, on all of these. So that basically means anyone who is utilizing the platform. So whether you are an administrator or whether you are an employee of the business, you all go toward that user count. Excellent, excellent. Are there any um, other questions? Um, does anyone else have any other questions that they want to pop, pop on and ask? No, excellent. So thank you um, so much, John, for um, sharing all this information with us. How can people get in contact with you? Yeah. Now, I've put your contact details on the, um, um, oh, yeah. oh, wait there. We, we might have Dorothy wanting to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> can you use it for contractors yeah um thank, thanks dorothy um <laughs> it's uh yes you can do you can use it for uh you can use it for contractors and we do see it so um one of the spaces that we see this uh, quite readily used is um in agriculture um the agricultural space they might have pickers and other bits and pieces where they'll have a um, a labour hire company supplying them with work and they want to collate the time and attendance. Um, so definitely you can have them on your system. What also benefits in the ag space specifically is they have they use our, our onboarding, um, more so the skills and so forth. So they might have inductions around machines, tractors, um, you know, you know, they have to have a food services certificate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that works really, really well. And they can then very quickly keep track of, you know, who's clocking on and off and who has done certain things because we physically, if we make it, let's say the food services certificate is critical. If they don't have it, we won't let them clock on. So it's really, really easy to see who's got it and who doesn't because if they can't, they haven't done it, they can't clock on. So um, definitely can use it for contractors and some, some businesses are actually a little crafty and what they do is they bill the contracting company um, uh, a per employee per week figure to actually supply them with the timesheet data that comes out of MicroKeeper. So we've definitely seen that done a number of times. Um, so yes, you definitely can use uh, it for contractors. Thank you very much for that, John. And uh, thank you, Dorothy, for that question. Do you have a partner program, Joy's, Joy's asking? We do, yeah, absolutely. So um, we do have a partnership program. Um, Basically, there are two key sort of different uh, sort of ways in which you can go. So we've got what's called the partner and the expert. Basically, the difference between the two is the partner is based around um, as a, as a um, referrer, all you want to do is do that. Just refer a business on to MicroKeeper and you want to stay at arm's length. So MicroKeeper will do the setup, the training, um, basically everything end to end. Um, so that's that's one form and you get you do receive a, a, um, a commission that runs over a six month period. Um, we then move to an expert. So you actually do have to start as a partner, whichever way you choose. Then um, depending on the capability of the business, but basically our account specialty team will make a call on, yes, look, this person could be a really great fit for an expert. And what an expert sort of wants to take on is they want to take on potentially the sale of MicroKeeper to their client. They take on the setup, the ongoing support. So they really uh, run the entire system 
with their client or, or help the client fully end to end. And in that case, it's actually a profit share uh, ongoing with that uh, particular expert. And I see there that on that page, you say that if you're the expert, um, you, you grow with us receiving industry leading rewards. So I imagine people are coming to you and then you're sort of um, um, tapping on the shoulders of the microkeeper experts to service them. Correct. Yeah, because that's one thing we do find is businesses will come to us and you might have an accounting practice, a bookkeeping firm, a payroll outsourcing company, you know, whatever it might be, an advisory company, um, and they all become partners or experts or whatever it might be. And then you'll have, a, we'll have a business that comes to us and says, hey, you know, we, we want X, Y, Z, and we're trying to achieve this. And we say, well, hey, we've actually got someone in your area that actually does that. Let's link you guys together. And guess mm -hmm. what? They can run your microkeeper for you as well, if you like. So definitely. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you so much, John. Um, any no other worries. questions are welcome to come through. But in the meantime, would you share with us how people can get in contact with you? Absolutely. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Just simply either come to our uh, website. You can either come through our um, our contact form. So it's as, as, as simple as jumping up here and clicking on the contact us option. You can either fill uh, a an automated ticket out or alternately you can ring through to our Geelong head office on the 1800 number below and you can um, have a chat to us. Um, and yeah, definitely we can uh, help facilitate or answer any questions that you may have. Does the, your solution works outside of Australia? Mm. Um, for payroll, no, it's specifically bespoke around the Australian uh, payroll rulings and, and legislation. But for all of the other elements, so the time and attendance, the rostering, the on employee onboarding, that sort of thing, yes, it can. Um, usually English speaking countries are, are the ones that do utilise the platform for that those areas. And again, that's one of the reasons why that open API, that we can either push the data across to an area where you want it to be, or, or alternately, um, you can pull data from the system when you need it. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that we've got some people from Malaysia dialing in today. So uh, hopefully that's of use to them as well. So thank you, um, John. And thank you everyone who've, who've joined us today for attending this session on MicroKeeper. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much, guys.